This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you spend some time in Melbourne, you'll notice there's something missing, and it's certainly not all the bubble tea shops. Compared to major cities across Europe, the Americas, and all around the world, there's no major town square or piazza. London has Trafalgar Square, Rome has Piazza di Spagna, and Berlin has Parisa Platz. Well, it turns out this was no accident. Instead, it was an active decision based on power and control. And it's one the city has spent almost 200 years trying to change. The town squares that we're familiar with these days are based on the Greek agora and Roman piazzas. These spaces have a lot of uses from being public meeting spaces, holding festivals and events, and markets. But there's one other important use that these town squares have. They return to Tahrir Square, thousands of Egyptians. To understand why there's this gap in Melbourne's design and architecture, you need to understand how the city started. Melbourne started as an illegal settlement on the banks of the Yarra River. And in 1837, surveyor Robert Hoddle and Governor Richard Burke headed to Melbourne to design the city. And there was a tension between the two of them and some of the design features, most notably how wide the roads should be. But there was one request from Governor Burke, and that was that Melbourne shouldn't include a city square, warning that the space would only encourage a dangerous spirit of democracy. And that square never made it into these initial plans. The successor to Governor Burke was Governor George Gipps, who wasn't any more supportive. In 1842, he declared that there should be no public squares in cities as they would only encourage democracy. And it wasn't that many decades before that the UK had kind of felt the impacts of a colonial uprising. And Melbourne's not the only Australian city that experienced this fate. The original plan for Brisbane also included wide streets and large public squares. This plan got the veto from Governor Gipps who felt that wide open spaces encouraged public disorder. And the city is feeling the impacts of this design decision to this very day. This is the State Library of Victoria and it's an incredible building and it's become one of the most visited libraries in the world. Since it opened during the gold rush in 1856, inclusivity for everyone's really been core to the mission, with admission to the library should be free to all persons over 14 years of age, without any letter of introduction or guarantee. Although if you use the library, you did need to have clean hands. Now in one key regard though, it wasn't as accessible as it is now. And that is what these bluestone walls give some clues to. If you look at old photos from this era, one difference really stands out. And that's these ornate gates and iron fences at the front. These would be open in the morning and locked in the evening, meaning this outdoor space couldn't be accessed by the public. This is all part of that sense of control of spaces for the public use. So while it's open now, these walls leave behind the reminder of what used to be here. What would a Melbourne with public squares look like? Well, one clue could be Adelaide, one Australian city which avoided this fate. And it has a massive Victoria Square in the heart of the city and is flanked by this series of four smaller squares. In 1954, Melbourne was facing some design challenges across the city, which resulted in the creation of a city-wide strategic plan. Melbourne, second largest city of Australia, a city which now contains more than one-sixth of the Commonwealth's total population. Amongst a range of other issues, the report noted that our city lacks a civic focal point. It said that the town hall area is busy and that every community has need at times for ceremonies of national rejoicing or solemn commemoration. And a city should have a place where its citizens can assemble together for such purposes. For those founders of the city more than a hundred years ago could not have visualized that one day their town was to become a vast metropolis of one and a half million people. And it put forward a bold idea based here, out the front of Parliament. And this place has become a bit of a de facto town square, including for things like protests. What this plan would do is transform this area. There'd be a huge civic square here, the full width of Parliament House, and it would run some distance down Burke Street. From there, government buildings would be at the front of the block. Now, this design never came to be, and the report was kind of right in saying that no doubt many people, for various reasons, will oppose the whole or portion of this conception. But a civic centre is badly needed in Melbourne. A wise plan has been created. Will it receive your support? It would be almost two decades later when Melbourne would next get its real attempt at a city square, called appropriately enough, City Square. 
The square itself was mostly bluestone, had a big digital screen, outdoor cafes, some public art and a water wall. And it was opened by the Queen in 1980 to a lot of fanfare, but it never really worked. The artwork vault was controversial and was moved, and never really attracted that many people on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, City Square has vanished, becoming this temporary acoustic shed while the Metro Rail Tunnel is being built underneath. But it will return with a new station entrance and it might get a second life. And that brings us to today, where the most recent development in Melbourne's long journey towards the town square is this, Federation Square. It is the same size as the city block, and in addition to this open space, there are restaurants, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, an Aboriginal Cultural Centre and Art Galleries. There are restaurants, but a proposed idea for an Apple flagship store was seen as a little bit too commercial, and those plans were shelved. And as for this being a day-to-day -day meeting place and a place you would just spend time, it hasn't caught on that well. Now, there are some things that are certainly helping, like this artificial grass, but it's still a bit of a destination, a place you go for events and activities. But it does seem to have scratched the city's itch for a public space like this, and there are fewer voices now trying to create a new alternative. So without a natural public meeting place like a piazza, Melburnians have always needed other places to meet up. That's helped drive the cafe culture, making places like bars and alleyway restaurants the place you're most likely to meet and connect in the city. But as for a place in public to meet and connect initially, well, without a town square to default to, that's become on the steps under the clocks at Flinders Street Station. Building communities is something which happens in person and online. And today's sponsor Squarespace can really help make that happen. If you want a beautiful website, they make it easy to design and build. Now I love nerding out about design and cities, but whatever you're interested in, you can build a website and a community around it using Squarespace. Now you can manage members, send emails, and it's got all the data tools you'll need to really understand them in one easy to use platform. You can easily display your social media posts on your site and go the other way and share your favorite website content with your social media channels. From building a simple site to creating an e-commerce platform, Squarespace makes the whole process enjoyable and simple. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Julian O'Shea to save 10% off your first website or a domain. I'm Julian O'Shea, thanks for watching. Hey mate.